Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. It's wonderful to be attending my first requirements engineering conference. I've long been fascinated by the area's blend of software engineering, HCI, and design, all areas of interest for me. I want to talk today about what we choose to make and why, and how we express those choices as requirements. And I want to complicate these decisions, linking the choice of making anything at all to the broader systems of oppression that marginalized groups experience every day. I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, you leave questioning the purpose of software engineering and see the purpose of requirements in a different light. So to get there, I want to share with you a story about evol my evolving relationship with requirements. We'll go all the way back to 1992 when I first discovered code. Uh, my relationship with code started in middle school when I was 12. I first discovered programming in my seventh grade pre-algebra class. My teacher required us to purchase a TI-82 graphing calculator and taught us how to write simple formulas. My classmate shared a version of Tetris after a summer of trying to make it fast enough to be playable, and I was hooked. At the time, requirements were tacit to me. Software was supposed to support my creative expression, whatever that happened to be. And I knew what I wanted, and I didn't need to write it down. That shifted a few years later when I discovered requirements in high school. After a few years of making software for myself, my friend and I decided to make a game together. He was an illustrator and sound engineer, and I was a developer, but we couldn't afford graphic design tools. So I set out to make a bitmap editor for tiled graphics. I didn't talk to him at all about what he needed. I just made something and found out later that he never used it because it didn't meet his needs. But he didn't want to hurt my feelings, so he never told me. By ignoring my friend's needs, I discovered requirements and the need to define them based on stakeholder needs. But this changed again. Um, when I went to college, I discovered computer science research. Throughout college at my alma mater, Oregon State University, I learned about programming languages, operating systems, software engineering, and more. But I used none of this in what I built for myself or with others since requirements were always given to me. I got disillusioned by the constraints that I perceived in industry, and so I pursued research where I could continue my creative expression. I came to view requirements as something imposed by teachers, organizations, and markets. They were a constraint on my creativity. And then I went to grad school, where I discovered software engineering. While learning my PhD at Carnegie Mellon, I learned that there's more to software engineering than I was taught. It was full of fascinating technical and social problems. I began to contribute technical solutions and social insights and continued to do so throughout my first several years of faculty life. And throughout this decade of research, I came to see HCI and design methods as key approaches to eliciting design requirements, um, but requirements engineering as a necessary process of specifying them to ensure conceptual integrity. So I thought I had requirements figured out as a researcher, but then I went to industry. Um, in 2012, I, I um, co-founded a startup just before earning tenure, and I took three years of leave to do it as the chief technology officer. <clears throat> I designed and engineered a stack, I made strategic business decisions, I set requirements, I managed a team of nine engineers and designers, and directly engaged in sales on a daily basis. While I was always pretty sure that the hard parts of engineering were people, now I was convinced. Everything hard was in sales, in marketing, management, and requirement solicitation. The technical parts of building a startup were really the easiest parts. I began to view the requirements not purely as technical, but as socio-technical constraints, things that had to account not only for the technical capabilities of some platform, but also what the state of the world was. And so when I returned from startup life, for the first time in my life, I had some time for myself on sabbatical. And I discovered myself. Post-tenure, post-startup, I finally had some time to deal with my lifelong gender dysphoria. But as I accepted myself as transgender and then came out, it became immediately clear how often software was not designed for me and was even designed against me in many cases, leading to people to deadname me, misgender me, bully me, and even physically harm me through medical errors. I came to realize that software requirements were more than just socio-technical. They were value judgments about how the world should be, and those judgments were often oppressive at my expense. Only short, shortly after I came out did other forms of oppression become crystal clear. Um, as I learned to live oppressed by sexism and transphobia, I watched as those far more marginalized than me were even more disregarded and oppressed by software. People without internet access were excluded entirely from COVID tests and vaccines. Black people in the US were surveilled, arrested, beaten, and killed, fueled by racially biased software and data. 
I began to see requirements as not just value judgments, but as instruments of dehumanization, modeling people as form fillers, as threats, as perpetrators instead of people. And so this brings me, how do I see requirements today? Requirements, they're not contracts, they're not constraints, they're not user needs. They are social infrastructure that reflect, reinforce, and amplify the matrix of oppression. This phrase coined by Patricia Hill Collins to describe many of the interacting social systems that create social hierarchies of power is a way of explaining the interacting dynamics of race, age, sex, gender, geography, nationality, religion, and more. They all interact and all affect individuals in radically different ways over time. Requirements then are how software comes to model this matrix of oppression. In a million tiny ways, each requirement models a cross section of our oppressive world, blueprinting how code will amplify its oppressive ideas. Now I know that's a big idea, so I'm gonna spend the rest of this talk trying to illustrate this idea. So here's our roadmap. I will do this by sharing three histories of requirements that have impacted marginalized groups. And I'll show how each requirement ultimately derives from the matrix of oppression. I'll end with a vision for anti-oppressive requirements and some of the challenging shifts this community might have to make to help dismantle the matrix of oppression through requirements engineering. So let's begin with an example that's likely familiar to everybody here, the IEEE Digital Library. Um, this is the professional organization that um, supports this conference. And IEEE in general is something that views its mission as advancing technology for humanity. But technology for who and which people? So let's talk about a requirements failure that's at play in this library. So here's some background. I changed my name in 2019. Um, I have what many trans people call a dead name. For many trans people, including me, when we read or hear our dead name, we feel pain, grief, regret, disrespect, erasure, much like if someone called a cis person by a name that wasn't theirs. Seeing my dead name usually ruins my day. The IEEE Digital Library dead names me all the time. Um, IEEE refuses to fix my name in my publications, causing me emotional harm every time someone dead names me in a citation, but also separating me from my professional history, robbing me of credit for my work and putting me at risk of harassment. For example, here is one of my most highly cited papers in IEEE publication. Um, about 300 out of the 500 citations um, cite me by my dead name and IEEE refuses to correct all of these, these dead name citations. So let's play a root cause analysis game of five whys. Why does IEEE refuse? Why will it not fix the dead names and misgendering in all of the citations um, of my papers? Well, here's the answer they usually give. Digital libraries were designed to store immutable information for printing. This is what they were originally designed for. Well, why immutable? Why isn't this information allowed to change? The answer is usually that research libraries represent a history of knowledge and history cannot change. Well then why include names and pronouns in this mutable history? I understand that the research content might not be something we want to change, but the names themselves and pronouns, these are not really part of the research contributions. Well, the response is usually names and pronouns are also part of history. Um, and this leads to another question, which is why would persisting obsolete names that refer to no one anymore be a valuable part of archiving our digital um, record of research discoveries? The answer is usually changing a name would violate a principle of historical accuracy. Well, why is accuracy more important than respecting people's names? And the answer usually boils down to this basic idea that the only people whose names are worth respecting are those who don't change. And this has always been true, right? This has been true for all kinds of different groups. When we look at this requirement, underlying this central idea is an oppressive idea, that names shouldn't change, that those who change their names shouldn't have their names respected, and that any harm authors experience from having their name ignored, including violent transphobic threats from somebody's trans status being disclosed, is less important than a certain concept of historical accuracy. So you might ask, well, wasn't this just a missing or a wrong requirement? Why can't we just think of it in those terms? Well, it wasn't a missing requirement. It was actually a value judgment. Consider the 1990s when IEEE started building its digital library. People had been changing their names for all kinds of reasons before that, beyond gender, including marriage, divorce, religion, personal safety, adoption, immigration. 
The IEEE requirements engineers ignored that obvious reality and chose to prioritize a view of names as history over a view of names as mutable pointers to individuals. It was plainly exclusionary. It was not something that people forgot that they didn't include. So you might be wondering how we know this. Well, this is because this is the resistance we face when demanding this change. Um, I'm part of the Name Change Policy Working Group, which includes trans scholars who've been advocating for name change policies across academia. Nearly every publisher that we approach about this change um, has resisted, arguing that it wasn't a missed requirement. Um, they instead argued that respecting names was less important than preserving history, exactly the argument that I presented here. So making this change in requirements um, required activism, it required changing culture. And we eventually won the war. ACM, IEEE, and two dozen other publishers eventually announced policies over the past two years, though most are implementing them slowly and poorly and refusing to change citations. Um, this oppressive requirement then was really a plain rejection of anybody who changes their name to be credited for this, their work. This is the matrix of oppression manifested as a software requirement. So at this point, some of you are probably uncomfortable, especially if you're socially conservative. Um, so take a deep breath because we have two more cases to go. So let's turn our attention now to HTML. Here is Tim Berners-Lee who wrote the first few HTML standards. Um, I love the web, you probably love it too. I'm grateful to him for helping shape it. But as he acknowledges, he made some mistakes. And here's one of them. Um, Every day, 30 million blind people globally use the internet to live their lives. They rely on access technologies called screen readers, such as Apple's voiceover on iOS, to translate the textual and visual content of the web into synthesized speech. Now here's the requirements failure. Most developers do not write HTML in a way that is compatible with screen readers. For example, one egregious example is not writing alt text on images, meaning that most of the image elements on the web are invisible to the people who are blind, excluding them from most news and art and culture. For example, take a look at this image on the right of one of the cutest kittens you've ever seen. Um, this HTML has no alt text. In case it wasn't clear, that's a joke. This is how blind people see most of the internet because people don't add descriptions of the images that are on the web. So why is this valid HTML? Well, let's play five whys again. Why don't developers write alt attribute text? Well, because they don't have to. Pages render regardless. Browsers will take an image tag and render it whether or not it has an alt attribute. So why don't developers have to do this? Because the standard doesn't require alt attributes. Well, why aren't they required? Well, per HTML 2.0, one of the earliest specs that um, led to the internet, the alt attribute was for processing constraints or user preference. It was not viewed as a requirement. So why processing and why preference? Well, this came about because the 90s internet was slow and browsers needed to show something while images downloaded. So why not require text? According to the W3C, the internet was getting faster, so alt attributes solved a temporary performance problem and they viewed them as eventually being deprecated and not being relevant anymore. And so this ties us into this really clear um, oppressive requirement. In the 1990s, Tim Berners-Lee, browser vendors and web developers viewed image descriptions as nice to have for people on slow connections, but ultimately a short-term issue because eventually everybody would be able to get images quickly. Not only is this not true because not everybody has a fast internet connection, um, but it certainly was never true for people who are blind. Um, you might think maybe this was a missing requirement then. Well, actually, no, it was a value judgment. Blind people existed in the 1990s when standards were being developed. <laughs> HTML and the web could have required alt attributes, but it just didn't. Berners-Lee, browser vendors, and developers all simply disregarded the needs of blind community, creating an internet ecosystem that made the visual web inaccessible um, as it continues to be today. So you might be wondering how we know this. Um, well, it's because after a decade of advocacy by blind and low vision developers, the alt attribute became required in the HTML 4.01 spec after blind developers demanded it. Image tags without one will no longer pass a validator. And yet still browsers render images without them. IDEs warn about them at best and developers largely ignore these warnings with fewer than 1% of images on the web actually containing a description. And so once again, change required activism. 
This change in HTML's requirements required blind users of the web to organize and advocate, forcing W3C to include them. And yet general disregard for people with disabilities persists in every other layer of implementation of the HTML 4.01 specification, especially browsers. Once again, the matrix of oppression was manifested as a software requirement. And so disregard for trans people underlied the IEEE digital library requirements and disregard for blind people underlied the web. These both show how requirements are social infrastructure that reflect and reinforce the matrix of oppression. Now let's turn our attention to our third case, um, which concerns race, by looking at the US police use of facial recognition software. So for background here, for the past 25 years, um, police in the United States, in particular the state of Florida, have submitted images to a federally funded state database that links faces to crime data. The software is used to identify people who have potentially violated laws. But there's a failure here. The data and algorithms used, while relatively accurate for faces of white people, are highly inaccurate for black people. The result is that every three days on average, someone in Florida is falsely identified, arrested, and jailed, and never told that they were how they were identified. Most can't afford bail or lawyers, and so they stay in jail, and most are black. For example, on the right, you see Najir Parks. He'd been in prison long ago on drug charges, but had since turned his life around. His grandmother called him one night, frantically saying that the police had come to their home looking for him. And so being a good citizen, he went to the police station to clear his name and they arrested him. They jailed him for 11 days before he was released. Um, and it was all due to a facial recognition error. So let's play the five whys again. Why did this happen? Why is Florida's recognition algorithm less accurate for black faces? The training data lacked a sufficient number of black faces. This is the usual story. But if we dig deeper, we find more. Why is the training data lacking? Well, the private company who makes it didn't gather data on black faces. They were just not included in the data set. Well, why didn't they include that data? The police and state bought the software independent of its accuracy on black faces. Well, why wasn't this a factor in that purchasing decision? Well, the state was convinced by aggregate accuracy measures, which hid any systematic bias. These are the only kinds of statistics that the company presented. So why wasn't bias a factor in those requirements of, um, from the state? Well, ultimately, it's because policing in Florida isn't about justice. It's about arrests, it's about politics, and it's about white fear of black people. It's not about making sure that people are not falsely arrested. And so when we look at this requirement, accuracy must exceed a certain amount by some aggregate measure. Um, this notion of accuracy, especially in the 1990s and even today throughout machine learning is seen as an aggregate measure, not a disaggregated measure. The company sold on that metric and Florida bought on that metric. And this requirement assumed that accuracy would be comparable across all groups, independent of their race, gender, or ability. This just wasn't true at all. So once again, we can ask, was this a missing requirement? Well, in this case, no, it was a value judgment. When Florida built the system, the goal was not equal treatment. If it had been, that would have been part of the core requirements. But police funding, which was tied to closely closing cases by making arrests, that was the thing that was the central concern. So uses of facial recognition could be less biased, but they're not because police departments and white majorities in the US do not see fairness to black people as a requirement for criminal justice. So how do we know this? Well, for years, black communities across the United States, as well as the United Kingdom, have been fighting legal battles over the use of facial recognition by police. And in a few cities, they've successfully managed to get it banned for the purposes of criminal justice. But in most cities, there is fierce resistance from technologists and white majorities who want to prioritize a sense of safety through facial recognition over a, a, a sense of racial justice. And so once again, in this third story, change required activism. This underlying culture of racism embedded itself in the requirements of facial recognition software, reinforcing and amplifying racist criminal justice outcomes, leading to thousands of innocent people being trapped in broken and criminal justice systems, all because of a flawed application of machine vision. And what it took to change this was people saying, no, this is an unacceptable oppressive requirement. So what can we take from these three cases? Well, I'll reiterate my original claim. Requirements are not contracts. They are not constraints. They are not user needs. They are social infrastructure that reflect, reinforce, and amplify the matrix of oppression. And they do this in ways that are often subtle and surprising. 
what these cases show is that software oppression derives from the broader systems of oppression in which we live, whether that's sexism, transphobia, ableism, racism, nationalism, xenophobia, or even capitalism. All of these find their ways into the concepts and visions that shape software requirements, resulting in software that serves majority groups at the expense of other marginalized groups. And here's how. Requirements engineering is done by and for majorities. If it's largely cis, heterosexual, non-disabled, white and Asian men developing, designing, negotiating, selling, and marketing software, and they are largely eliciting requirements and data from that same demographic, it's inevitable that software is going to reflect their values and nobody else's. And worse yet, requirements give um, these groups a kind of organizational and individual ethical cover. They might just say, well, we just built what they told us to build. It's not our fault. The result of this, of course, is that the software that's created works for those who hold power and often harms, excludes, and oppresses everybody else. So how do we overcome this? We get to decide, will software be a tool for reinforcing oppression or dismantling it? There really isn't a lot of neutral ground here. If we want software to help dismantle, we need a kind of anti-oppressive requirements engineering. So what might that look like? I'll share three examples of principles that we might try. One is that we might start by centering the margins in all requirements engineering. Um, we should focus our research activities and outputs on people marginalized in society and not on majorities. This means understanding the full diversity of experiences, needs, and contexts in which people live, not just average cases, but especially outliers. And you might wonder, if we design requirements for marginalized groups, won't that mean ignoring the needs of the majority? Well, yes and no. Yes, because the majority's needs are often at the expense of marginalized groups, so ignoring those needs is actually a good thing, ethically. But no, because serving marginalized groups often serves majorities too. Text messaging, closed captioning, curb cuts, name change policies for um, publishers, racial, facial recognition bans, all of these things are in service of marginalized groups, but ultimately ended up helping everybody. A second principle we might consider is centering resistance. Software requirements engineering has to be a site of resistance. It's the responsibility of requirements analysts and developers to reject oppressive requirements and accept responsibility for harm if they don't. This means engaging in social conflict with majorities, demanding change and deprioritizing profit in many cases where profit isn't the central goal. This is a change from our status quo. Most developers, designers and software engineering researchers view their role as purely technical. And this makes sense that that is their training but that doesn't absolve them of responsibility of social consequences of their technical decisions. Pretending we don't have these responsibilities is much like being a bystander, watching as somebody commits violence against another and does nothing to intervene. But actually it's worse than that. It's like handing a bat to somebody who wants to do violence and hoping that they don't hurt somebody. And third, we need to center humanity if we want to be anti-oppressive in our requirements engineering. It has to be a discipline about people first. This means that the software being made has to be secondary in our thoughts. In fact, anti-oppressive requirements in engineering may mean refusing to engineer software that poses harm to marginalized groups, or actively advocating for the dismantling of oppressive software that's already been made. And I know this can seem counterintuitive. We're computer scientists. Isn't it our job to make things and to solve problems? Yeah, sometimes. But it's also to decide when not to make things, because by making them, we might create more harm or more problems. There's really no one better position to refuse than us, since we're the ones making. So does this sound scary? Probably. And I can say from experience, it is. My transition from bystander to activist continues to be frightening. It's thrust me into social conflict, which requires resilience and patience and community. This talk is designed to create conflict. I suspect some of you in the audience, especially perhaps our closing keynote speaker, is itching for conflict. But silence is a privilege. As a trans person, this is a privilege I don't have. I don't really have a choice in this matter, and neither do the disabled people in our community or the black people or the women or the other groups that CS often disregards. If we aren't impressive in our work and life, we aren't able to be free. We aren't able to be ourselves. We don't have the privilege of silence and inaction as majorities do. And I would honestly love if I didn't have to do any of this advocacy, but it's not a luxury I have. So what will you choose? Will you continue to study and teach requirements engineering as a neutral discipline at the expense of people's inclusion, safety, and freedom? 
Or will you center margins, resistance, and humanity and how you imagine software requirements, demanding software that works for everyone and hurts no one? I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much for your time.